So this is, uh, this is a bit of a strange talk. This is a, a coming, something that comes out of a project that Mike Hill and I are uh, involved in. And uh, we needed to get some things uh, straight about hop rings. Hop rings are an invention of Ravenel and Wilson. Um, and they, Haynes described them a little bit um, in his talk this morning. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about those uh, today. So as I say, this is joint work with Mike Hill. but. Um, a lot of thanks goes to John Francis. We were grappling with a technical point. He made an extremely valuable suggestion about what category we should be working in. And um, that kind of led to all the things I want to talk about today. So let me begin. Um, I feel like I. All right. Is that, is this, is this OK? Can you hear me? Yep. All right. So let me begin. Uh, so I want to, this is a theorem about the complex cobordism spectrum. So that'll be the complex cobordism spectrum. And for n, an integer n, I'll write this to be the zero space of the n-fold suspension of mu. And I'm mostly interested in the spaces with an even index. So I'm mostly going to be interested in, uh, in mu in the, in the even spaces. So there's this amazing theorem of Steve Wilson, which says that the homology of these spaces um, has the property that it's 0 when star is odd, and it's a free abelian group when star is even. Um, so there's, there's a whole world around these terms. This implies these spaces have even dimensional cells and even dimensional homotopy. And um, it, it unlocks a whole uh, strikingly um, structured theory of spaces like that. So there's two reasons I wanted to start with this theorem. One is um, this is a conference in honor of Doug. And I wanted Doug to experience that serenity one feels when praise is heaped upon one's arch rival. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, the other reason, so this, is, this theorem dates from about 1973. And that lets me segue into the improvement on this theorem. Um, so it's an improvement and a new proof that uh, due to Ravenel and Wilson, which in, in, so this is around 1976, which says that this collection, so this is homology with integer coefficients, but this is characterized by a universal property. All right. So I wanted to um, what we're the what we're doing. What Mike and I have been doing is um, required us to to develop and, and establish a refinement to this universal property. Um, so I haven't told you, obviously, what the universal property is. And most of what I want to do today is going to be just to explain what their universal property is and what the, um, what the, the generalization of it is. So let me first, I, so the other thing about this circle of ideas with these something like complex cobordism and something like even spaces is that this seems to come up in a lot of other contexts. And that was the work Mike was doing. So one of the places it comes up is um, C2 equivariant homotopy theory. So, so there, the analog of complex cobordism is what's called real boardism which was introduced by Land, Peter Landweber and Araki. 
And that's just complex cobordism with Z2 acting by complex conjugation. Um, there's an analog of an even sphere. So S2n, let's think of that as complex projective n space mod complex projective n minus 1 space. And, um, and so, uh, so Z2 can act on that by complex conjugation. And then there's these uh, spaces. So this is, as a space with a Z2 action, the one-point compactification of the regular representation of Z2. OK, so the analog of this collection of spaces would be mu n, mu r n rho. That'd be the analog of mu 2n. Now, <clears throat> we need a. Uh, substitute first for Wilson's theorem. And Wilson's theorem stated very much about abelian groups. And it's not clear what kind of homology one wants to take about with this. And in fact, when you're working in equivariant homotopy theory, homology groups are Mackey functors. And they're a somewhat more elaborate algebraic object. And you often find yourself fighting the language a little bit. In, with ordinary abelian groups. And in fact, this, this paper of Ravenel and Wilson is it's very much computationally oriented. And it's very much uh, written in terms of references to elements of rings. And when we're thinking about Mackey functors and stuff like that, it's harder to be thinking about. It's harder if you're writing things in terms of specific elements of things. And so one thing we need is a, to even formulate an analog is a of a statement of Wilson's theorem that's equivalent that isn't quite so dependent on the category of abelian groups. So I can state Wilson's theorem in an alternate way. So another version of Wilson's theorem. Another way of saying it is that the smash product of the eilenberg maclean spectrum with this is a wedge of even suspensions of the eilenberg maclean spectrum. So I could have said this about chain complexes. The category of modules over the eilenberg maclean spectrum is the category of chain complexes. And it's saying the chains on this space has a very specific form. But I want to write it this way, because this, this is the form that generalizes. <clears throat> so that's an equivalent version of Wilson's theorem, but said without talking about free abelian groups or things like that. <clears throat> All right, so the an there's an analog of Wilson's theorem here, which is due to Mike Hill and myself. And it says that um, I'll write it almost in the same way. So it superficially looks the same. And in this world, z is the constant Mackey functor. At z. So, um, so it's not important for this talk that you be fluent in Mackey functors or anything like that. Um, I'm going to state a very general uh, kind of result. Um, my, my main purpose is a very general kind of result. But this is, it was in formulating, formulating this specific equivalence that we were led to seek a more general version of the Ravenel-Wilson universal hypothesis, universal property. OK, so this is, this is an analog of Wilson's theorem in Z2 equivariant homotopy theory. There's actually the whole theory of even spaces and all that um, works there as well. But as I said, my the focus of my talk is in this technical thing that came up in, in trying to find uh, more than just a random equivalence here, a good map between something with a universal property and something you're trying to understand. All right, now there's one other world where this is a good thing to look at. Let's see, I guess I'm over. Uh, I guess I'll leave that up. <clears throat> and that is. Uh, That's in motivic homotopy theory. 
So in motivic homotopy theory, in motivic homotopy theory, um, the analog of complex cobordism is called MGL, and it's still the Tom complex of the universal bundle over the classifying space for vector bundles. But now um, one's imagining the ground field or the ground ring might not be the complex numbers, it might be the real numbers, or the, it might be the integers. And the analog of an even sphere is still the quotient of projective space um, by the previous one. And in the world of motivic homotopy theory, this is also written as S2NN. N. And so the analog of the spaces Wilson considered would be the zero spaces um, of these shifts. And um, one would like to know if the analog of Wilson's theorem holds. And so that's something that we don't know how to prove, but I think this is a, a really interesting conjecture. Thank you. Just infinity. It's, the z the, it's just the zero space. Yeah. So in this world, um, there's something. So in this world, we don't, oops, I screwed up. Sorry, pro tip, uh, we have these boards. I teach at boards like this, but obviously not this semester. The shadow is really hard to see, so you have to always work so that you're never in the situation I just put myself in. Um, I guess I'll, maybe I can do this next time. So, uh, all right, so the, so there's something that um, Aravind Azok and John Fazel and I call the Wilson space hypothesis. And that says that, um, that there's an equivalence from the analog of the eilenberg maclean spectrum, that this is a wedge of even sus suspension. Okay, so HZ is Voivodsky's motivic cohomology spectrum. And this Wilson space hypothesis, it implies a lot of interesting theorems in, uh, of, of, in algebra. So for instance, so one of the things it implies, so one consequence, so this is a theorem of uh, Arvin, um, John Fazel, and myself that this Wilson space hypothesis implies that, um, that the algebraic vector bundles, the map from algebraic vector bundles on something I'll call Pn tilde um, to ordinary vector bundles on Cpn uh, rank, uh, rank k is a bijection where Pn tilde is the space of uh, linear matrices from Cn plus 1 to itself such that T squared is T at the projection operator and the rank of T is 1. So that, that maps to projective space by sending T to its image and the fiber, well any two projection operators with the same image differ by a linear, they're, I mean the fibers are affine spaces. So this is a, this map from Pn tilde to Pn is a homotopy equivalence in A1 homotopy theory. Anyway, this tells you a lot of things about algebraic vector bundles or even, this is an affine variety, it tells you a lot of things about, um, about um, projective modules over this algebraic variety. So this is a different story as well, 
but this is sort of, I just want to indicate that this theorem of Wilson's, and in fact the Ravenna-Wilson theorem, seems to be something that, that works in a lot of different categories. And um, I don't really have a good explanation for why, uh, but, um, but, I wanna, but it's useful to set it up so that the language is convenient, the language of Hopferings and all that is convenient for these, these other categories. All right, let me move on to sort of more. Instead of telling you things I'm not going to talk about, let me tell you the things I am going to talk about. Okay, so this structure that um, this structure that Ravenel and Wilson came up with to to talk about to, to describe this universal property was something they called a Hopfring. So I want to. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Hopfring. And um, I want to do it from the point of view of universal algebra, or what are called Levere algebras. And, um, uh, and um, I'm going to run out of room, but I didn't, this is not the, this, uh, the idea of kind of really trying to develop the Ravenel-Wilson theory from the point of view of Levere algebras um, is in a paper of Andrew Stacy and Sarah Whitehouse. All right, so I'm not really going to talk about universal algebras in general. I'm just going to talk about specific universal algebras, and that probably cancels two words, so I'm just going to talk about algebras. But from the point of view of, from the point of view of Levere algebra, certain things are, uh, work out a lot, uh, much cleaner. Okay, so what's the setup? The setup is to start with some category S, and at the moment you should just think of S as like the category of sets. So this will be some category with finite products. So in particular, um, this is one of these edge cases. In particular, there's a zero-fold product, um, which is, uh, so in particular, there's a zero-fold product is the terminal object, which I'll just call a point, a one right now. <coughs> so every, there, every object has an n-fold product. Zero is a finite number. The zero-fold product is in this category. All right, now, um, so if you have a category like this and you have an algebraic structure that's defined by um, operations from one product of x to another and maybe some constants like 0 and 1 satisfying some conditions, then that, you can talk about that kind of an algebra in this category. That's nothing new, and this is even how Ravenel and Wilson wrote about, about Hopfrings. But um, so, so let me just say that. So in such a category, I could talk about, say, a ring in this category S. So that's an object X equipped with an addition law, a composition law, a multiplication law, and a constant, 0, which we'll think of as a map from this terminal object back to x, satisfying all the usual properties of, you know, uh, uh, distributivity, commutativity of the, you know, all the usual properties of uh, uh, a ring. So the universal algebra description talks about the most general kind of algebraic structure one could talk about in a category like this just built out of operations from products of copies of x to itself. And I, yeah, I meant a commutative ring. I want this to be a commutative ring with a unit. Okay. So that's the, oh, darn, I did it, <laughs> did it again. Um, how can I not do this? All right. Uh, okay. So that's, um, so those aren't quite the, mo the ones we want to consider. 
we want to consider algebras over the complex cobordism ring. So let me write mu upper bullet to stand for, so I'm going to use the symbol bullet to stand for evenly graded things. So, so this will be the collection of mu 2n where mu 2n is mu minus 2n which is pi minus 2n of mu or mu upper 2n of a point. So this is an evenly graded ring and we could talk about evenly graded Uh, commutative mu algebras in our category S. Okay, so what is that? Um, so so what is that? So it is such a thing. It's a collection of objects x2n for every even n, which I might just call this x bullet. And they have to have an addition law. Each of these x2n's is an abelian group. There's a multiplication. I didn't. So, as I think you know, so you, uh, yes, I did. Is, is that enough? Okay, then my next question is the groups you wrote down there, are they, they seem to vanish at the end of positive, is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's so that, yes, yes. It's so that, let me, here, I'll get, okay. So, I have a multiplication map from x to n cross x. 2m into x to n plus m. And um, now I have some constants, right? I have a 0 for every, um, every one of these abelian groups has a 0 in it. And I have a, a constant a. Now it's an, it's an m, or I have a 1. And I have a constant a for every a in mu upper 2n. Now, why have you zero? Yes, thank you. All right, sorry, I got rattled by Doug's question. Now, yes, one is in degree, uh, one is in degree zero. Thank you. Okay. And those satisfy all the properties of an algebra over, over mu. OK. <clears throat> OK, so that's, that's an mu, I'll call that an mu algebra in S. And these, this is the structure. I, I haven't even, this is it's spelled out exactly in this way in Ravenel and Wilson's paper. <clears throat> and um, OK, but what's the category? We're not going to do this in some random category S, and I want to consider a slightly more general category than, um, than might seem necessary at first. Oh, but before I do that, let me just make one remark. Uh, let me see, okay. So let me make one remark. So this is equivalent this structure is equivalent to giving to the functor the collection of these things. So that's a sequence. So for every object in S, I can look at the functor re represented by x2n. I can look at the functor represented by x2n, that's a priori just a functor in sets, but I want to give this the structure of an evenly graded uh, mu algebra. Right, that's equivalent to that data, and sometimes this is a, a useful, a better point of view, or a useful point of view for this. Okay, 
So I think I have to go to write on this board. So, OK, so that's not quite. Oh, so now let me make a couple of remarks from, univer about, from the theory of universal algebras. So one is that, um, so this is the first observation. And um, so both of these are due to Levere and Linton. So the first observation is that, um, so now I'm going to talk about, so we have to give a name to these kind of algebras. And I, I just want to use a generic name at first. So we'll have the category of algebras of some kind in S. And I have this forgetful functor to S. All right. So um, products of algebras are obviously just products. And in fact, this functor commutes with whatever co-limits exist in S. Um, and it also commutes with some, I mean, so it commutes with whatever limits exist in S. It also creates sifted colons. This is also uh, kind of obvious. A sifted colimit is a, is a colimit that commutes with products automatically. So the classical example is the beginning of a simplicial thing. So if I have two arrows and a degeneracy map, so a common section of both of them, then the, the co-equalizer of that diagram commutes with products. That's the, that's the basic thing that goes into showing that the geometric realization of a product of simplicial sets is the product of the geometric realization. So sifted colimits means they commute with products. And if my, my structure on x is defined by a bunch of maps between products, when I take colimits the, of these things, if those colimits preserve products, then I'll still have that exact same structure. And if I don't know that a certain colimit exists here, but the, and it's a sifted colimit and it exists down here, it will automatically exist here. So that's an important thing. And then the other observation is that um, that if, um, if S has all colimits, then, then U has a, left has a left adjoint. Um, which is some sort of a free algebra function. OK, so these follow. These are, the proofs of these are very simple and very, very beautiful. It's like all these things in category theory. The formulation is ingenious. And once you, once you, uh, under, once you uh, get kind of fluent in the formulation, these things are, are quite simple. But I have a lot of uh, things I want to get to today. And I'm not going to say any more about it, except that just from universal algebra, one knows that these free algebras exist and that these kind of co-limit, that you can take an algebra and you can mod out an equivalence relation as long as that equivalence relation was, was you know, had a, had a splitting like that. So I'm, that's, this is a little technical, so I won't, I'm not going to linger on that, though it will, it'll play a role is what I want to say. All right. <clears throat> And um, I wonder if this is the point to say this. Uh, all right, let me get into what hop rings and ho are. So, so now I want to. Uh, so this isn't quite where we want to work. So now I want to suppose C is a, a symmetric monoidal category. So, um, so that means it's got a, a symmetric monoidal structure and a unit, and um, that's what it is. And then um, we can talk about coalgebras in C. Oh, I'm sorry. What I meant to say was, if you don't know what that is, think about um, 
uh, the category of graded abelian groups. And tensor is the usual tensor product, how, and the tensor unit is Z. Um, and I haven't told you the symmetry part of the symmetric monoidal structure, and that's the usual one with the sign rule in it, negative 1 to the degree of x, degree of y. So the usual symmetric monoidal structure on graded abelian groups. That's, that's going to be the main example for a while uh, until, I, uh, and until I start to formulate this more general universal property. So but the thing we want to consider is for S is the category of coalgebras in C. And by that, I mean, so a coalgebra is something with a coproduct map. And I want to assume that it's co-commutative. And co-associative, that's part of being a coalgebra. And I want it to be co-unital. So the category of coalgebras in C is a category with finite products. And the finite products are given by the underlying monoidal structure. Okay, so, so, so coalgebras in C has finite products given on underlying objects by um, the monoidal structure. So if you're not used to this, well, I'll give you some examples in just a sec. Uh, OK, and now um, a hop ring in C That's a commutative ring in coalgebras. And um, a Hopf ring over mu in C is going to be an evenly graded uh, mu algebra. Coalgebras. All right. So Ravenel and Wilson's universal property characterizes, well, their theorem shows, and I'll explain this in just a second, their theorem shows that, that the aggregate of the homologies of those spaces forms one of these Hopf rings, and that this Hopf ring satisfies a universal property in this category. So let me give a name for this category. I'll call it Hopf rings over mu, and then in C. OK, that'll be the category of hop. So those are commutative mu star algebras in this category of coalgebras. I want commutative mu star algebra maps. That's what this category is. And they, Ravenel and Wilson characterize the homology of mu as an object in this category. OK, well, I haven't said what C is. So the next theorem. I want to I want to I want to work my way up to the Ravenel Wilson result and then explain why one wants a slightly better a slight improvement on the universal property. So I first uh, so there's the following proposition um, and I think it's due to obvious um, and that that makes the date like negative infinity or whatever I don't know but anyway, that is that if I have a functor that's symmetric monoidal, then F takes, induces, it takes hop rings in C. to hop rings over mu in D, or whatever, any algebraic structure in C to any algebraic structure like that. So that's, that's obvious. And um, 
OK, so now let me go through a couple of, oh, so there's one other, oops. So let me now um, explain the Ravenel-Wilson universal property and then explain how algebraic, how I want to think of algebraic topology as getting us into that universal property. So for that, the, the other piece of information I need is, so we're going to, I'm going to start with C being graded abelian groups like before. And in this category, um, let's let A1 be the co in So this is going to be a co-algebra. Here and it's um, it's just the homology of CP infinity. So it's given by the coproduct is given by beta n goes to the sum over i plus j equals n of beta i tensor beta j. All right, and then um, a one a n will be a one to the n. So that's the homology of the n-fold product of CP infinities. And in particular, A0 is just Z. <clears throat> All right, so now I can, oh, and there's another map. There's a couple of maps between these. So there's a map from A2 to A1 induced by the map in homology from a product of CP infinities to itself classifying the tensor product of the universal line bundles. I'll call that map mu. And then um, I'm going to use this map. And then there's also a unique map I'll call 0 from A0 into A1. There's a unique coalgebra map that sends 1 in Z. That's the integers to beta 0. That's the unique coalgebra map. So I'm going to use these two maps. All right. <clears throat> okay. So forgive me if you already know this stuff. Everything I've said is more is said almost exactly this way in the Ravenel Wilson paper. But now I want to um, I want to kind of I want to start pushing the formulation just a little bit. So okay. So what is the Ravenel Wilson universal property? So I want to define a functor from. Uh, I'm going to define a functor from Hopfring's over mu with values in this category to, a B, to sets. And what it does is it sends x, one of these x's, to the set of all elements x in x2 of A1. Oh, I forgot to introduce some notation. Um, um, X to N of B is just going to be coalgebra maps from B into X to N. So I'm thinking of these as, I'm thinking of the aggregates of these X's as a functor that takes a coalgebra and gives you a commutative algebra over MU. And so so the, the, this is the degree two part of that commutative algebra. And I want an element x in here such that 0 star x is 0, and mu star x is given by the formal group law. OK. So that's a functor. And um, the, the, the Ravenel-Wilson theorem is Is that this? So let me call this functor T. No, I called. It, I already called it T. Let me call it T again. And that functor T, the theorem, the Ravenel Wilson theorem is that the functor T is co representable um, by a Hopfring. Okay. And so it's co representable, and we'll call the um, co representing object the Ravenel-Wilson Hopfring. So 
So, um, so this will be the co-representing object. Now, I have a few things to say about this. The first thing is, um, before Doug, before you and Steve bust your button of pride, um, I want to tell you that nobody really believed your proof of this, um, <clears throat> including Steve. Steve, in a survey about Hopfrings, writes that, that um, you proved this theorem without ever really rigorously defining this object. And in fact, no, nobody believed it so much that three people wrote down proofs of the existence of this. So, um, so there's also a proof by uh, Hunton and Turner. Um, and there's a proof by uh, Paul Gorse using Dudenay theory. And a proof by Stacy and Whitehouse um, using using these universal algebras. And in fact, if you really think about the Stacy Whitehouse argument, it really is what Doug and Steve say. So I think, I, I mean, I made this joke that you didn't prove it because Steve makes this joke that you don't prove it. But I think you really do. I think the argument you indicate for the existence of this object really is in, um, it is the universal algebra argument. So I've set things up so I can explain this. Um, quite easily, right? Why does that exist? Well, I mean, I have to give you an element in Ax of this to satisfy these equations. Well, what does it mean to give a, a, a map from A1 into X2? That's the same thing as a map from the free offering on A1 concentrated in degree 2. That's a, a, ma a map from that into X. And then, um, the equations it has to satisfy, one of them takes place in A2, one of them takes place in A1, uh, that's just going to be the section, and one of them takes place in A0. Oops. So there's two maps here, and then, um, I won't put that too. So this is a reflexive co-equalizer diagram. So these free things exist by Levere's general theorem, and then reflexive co-equalizers always exist in abelian groups, and so this, this exists. This exists for that reason. So that's a sketch of the Stacy. What Stacy and Whitehouse point out is, you know, this this existence theorem is covered much in the way Ravenel and Wilson talk about it in this category of um, of Hopf. Uh, in you just using this theory of universal algebra. Now, gosh, going slow, but let me state. Okay, so now I want to. Um, so this. So I have this obvious proposition. Let me erase it and then use it. So. The, so here's another example. Um, we could take C to be the category of spaces. Now, it takes a little bit of thinking, but in the category of spaces, every object has a unique co-commutative, co-unital, co-algebra structure, uh, namely the diagonal map. And it's because it's co-unital that it's unique. So co-algebras in C is also the category of spaces. <clears throat> OK, so suppose, for instance, suppose R is a, a complex-oriented cohomology theory. OK, then the spaces R2n, well, what happens? So homotopy classes of maps from a space in, say, a space Y into that. That's the R 2n cohomology of Y. And those form a, an algebra that forms a graded, an evenly graded MU algebra. OK, well, so somewhere I had this that I've given the structure of an evenly graded commutative MU algebra on the functor these things represent. And therefore, these R bullets, um, which is the collection of these R 2Ns, that forms a Hopfring 
over mu in spaces. And um, this also had a complex orientation So this, has a, so this also has a complex orientation. So that's an element x, which is a map from Cp infinity into the second space of R. Okay, And that satisfies, by definition of the formal group law, that mu that 0 star x is 0. It's a pointed map. And um, mu star x is the sum of aij x to the i, y to the j, by definition of the formal group law. I mean, these are equations in the R cohomology of Cp infinity. All right, so this is one of these gadgets that the Ravenel-Wilson universal property would hold to. So now let's, um, let's apply the obvious theorem. So if I take a functor, let's look at like homology with coefficients in k, where k is a field. So that maps spaces to coalgebras in graded abelian groups. And so therefore, um, the homology, of the, the aggregate of the homology of these spaces, so let's just call that, let's just call that with that symbol. That's a Hopfring over mu equipped. Oh, and then the other thing to point out, just by definition, that A1 is the homology of Cp infinity with integer coefficients. So that obviously maps to the homology of Cp infinity with coefficients in this field k. And so this automatically comes equipped with you know, all the data for the universal property. And then, um, and then you, and therefore, by the Ravenel-Wilson, therefore, there's a map from, um, so therefore, there's a map from the Ravenel-Wilson Hopfring to the homology of these uh, to this. Okay, there's a map of Hopfrings. over mu in graded abelian groups. Now, the, the theorem, so the theorem is, uh, let me state it in a, in a way that you can't quite state it. So the theorem of Ravenel and Wilson is that this map into the homology of mu with integer coefficients is an isomorphism. So that's one part of the theorem. And the other part of the theorem is that for each n, this, which is a, this is a Hopf algebra over the integer, so it's a commutative ring in particular. For each n, this is a, a polynomial ring over a Laurent series ring. In fact, it's a polynomial ring over the group ring of, of mu uh, minus 2n, or mu upper 2n. OK. So these are two kind of really remarkable things. I mean, this. This isomorphism in this implies Wilson's theorem. But um, you can't quite set it up this way. So for one thing, in order for this to take values in coalgebras, I needed to be working over a field. And the ring of integers isn't a field. I could get around that if I knew that these spaces had a Kunath formula for z, or in other words, if I knew the homology was torsion-free. But that's essentially what Wilson's theorem is. So, in order to use this universal property as I've advertised it, you'd need to know in advance that, that you sort of need Wilson's theorem in advance, or you need 
to do something over every field and then assemble the results together. So that's a fine technique, and that's what Ravenel and Wilson do in abelian groups, but that's not a very good technique in Mackie functors. It's resolving a Mackie functor by fields in Mackie functors is a complicated process, and it's a kind of hopeless procedure in motivic homotopy theory. <coughs> so, um, and the other thing is, so in, in, in Ravenel and Wilson's argument, the, the fact that this is a polynomial ring is proved in tandem with this theorem. So there's, one proves a little bit about this, one proves a little bit about this map, one gets a little bit more about this from some spectral sequences, and one gets a little bit more about the structure here. And you're, um, anyway, what one learns this purely algebraic theorem because of its relationship with topology. So I'm getting close to the end of my time, and I want to tell you the, I want to tell you the universal property, so I'm going to kind of cut to the chase. Um, but before I do so, let me just tell you, we've, we've been rethinking this theory a lot, and mostly rethinking means kind of thinking about it, trying to not refer to elements of rings, try to do it in terms of universal algebras, and tried to separate out the purely algebraic statements from the topological ones. And mostly, it's a testimony to this paper of Ravenel Wilson, all the arguments you it's really, everything Mike and I have done is kind of a, just rearranging their arguments. But we are able to prove by purely algebraic means that this is a polynomial ring over here, over this. And what I want to do now is describe our main theorem, which is a refinement to the universal property that lets you make this map um, without knowing the Kunis formula. So, so let me get to that, and then I think I'll be able to wrap up on time. So, so I was going to tell these stories a, a little bit more drawn out way, but um, I'm going to try to compress these so that they all fit in um, just in a few minutes. <coughs> so, so the problem with the place I ran into the Kunis formula here was I needed the homology to, to be, the functor homology to be a symmetric monoidal functor, and it's not. But chains is. So we could have, we could have gone from spaces to HZ modules by sending a space. So this means the homotopy category, the homotopy category of HZ modules. So I'll just write as mod HZ by sending a space to HZ bash a space with a disjoint base point. So that's like the chains on X. So this is a symmetric monoidal category under um, smashing over HZ. And this functor is a symmetric monoidal functor. So without the Kunis formula, I would know that um, if I had an, a complex-oriented R, then HZ smash R underline, which means this collection of these spaces, this is an evenly graded ring over MU in HZ modules. Okay, that's just a consequence of the obvious, the, 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 the obvious theorem. This is a symmetric monoidal functor. And so that's great, except the Ravenel-Wilson Hopfring doesn't really live in that category. It's a Hopfring in graded abelian groups. But there's this cool thing that happens, and I'm going to want to mention this in three different categories. <coughs> so the cool thing is this. So. Um, <coughs> So inside the category of HZ modules, let me define a subcategory. 
So T will be for Tate. Uh, so this will be the full, this will be the, the smallest full subcategory um, containing HZ smash an even sphere and closed under direct sums, arbitrary direct sums. Okay, now that's, um, you know, modules over HZ is a triangulated category. It has coproducts, but it doesn't have coequalizers. It doesn't have, it's, a, it's kind of a funny, it's unusual in homotopy theory to kind of be thinking about working in the homotopy category like this. Now, this subcategory is also a symmetric monoidal category. And in fact, um, what happens when I, um, if I look at HZ module maps from this into this, if M is not equal to N, that's zero if M is not equal to N and Z if m is equal to m. And what this implies is that the functor that sends uh, evenly graded, so this is going to be evenly graded free abelian groups. That functor to here is an equivalence of categories. So anything of symmetric monoidal categories. So I could take the Ravenel-Wilson Hopfring. Once I've proved by algebraic means that the Ravenel-Wilson Hopfring is a Hopfring in free abelian groups, then I can take it, it's, it's a Hopfring in here, and I can apply this functor, and I get a Hopfring in this category. Now this is something that happens a lot. So, oh, I'm going to just go, I'm going to try to wrap this up in just a minute. So, so I'll just have to tell you, there's something, there's a calculation you can do. So I can also make a functor from, um, from free abelian groups, evenly graded free abelian groups to modules over the, the homotopy category of modules over the constant Mackey functor Z. So these are Z2 equivariant modules over the constant Mackey functor Z. And, um, oh, excuse me. So let me just say these are generated by So this map that sends z shifted by n to hz smash sn row, this is also an equivalence of categories um, because a computation like this holds. So the Ravenel-Wilson Hopfring I can transport, once I know it's free for algebraic reasons as a Mobelian group, I get an, a copy of it sitting inside hz modules. And there's something similar. into um, Voivodsky's category. So now I just want to look at the, the pure Tate motives in Voivodsky's category. So these, this will be the ones generated by HZ smash S2NN. This is also an equivalence of symmetric monoidal categories because there's a computation like this. So the Ravenel-Wilson Hopfring, once it's a Hopfring in graded free abelian groups, you can make it live in all of these other symmetric monoidal categories. And you can make an argument that whenever you have an oriented ring spectrum of an appropriate kind, you get a hop ring with an X satisfying the conditions that the Ravenel-Wilson hop ring universal property satisfy. Okay, however, um, that isn't the whole story uh, because now we've changed the category so this is the universal property. Well, we've changed the target category. <clears throat> the, 
the Ravenel Wilson prop Hopfring has a universal property in Hopfrings in abelian groups. And now we've got this Ravenel Wilson Hopfring living in a whole bunch of different categories. And what we really need is that it satisfies the same universal property in those categories. So let me just state the main theorem and then I'll stop. So, so we have the following theorem, which is due to Mike Hill and myself. And so that's the following. So suppose C tensor 1 is uh, a symmetric monoidal category. which is additive, and, and the tensor product distributes over sums in each variable. OK. And then suppose we also have, um, um, suppose I have a functor from uh, a symmetric monoidal functor from free, evenly graded free abelian groups into C. So suppose this functor commutes with sums. So it's automatically an additive functor, but I want it to commute with arbitrary sums. And it's symmetric monoidal. So that happens in all of these cases. Well, this is an equivalence of categories, but this inclusion commutes with arbitrary sums, and it's symmetric monoidal, and it's the same in the Z2 equivariant case. So suppose you have that, <coughs> then so then the, the conclusion is then functor T from offerings over MU in C to sets sending X to the set of all elements X in the second space applied to G of A1 such that um, these two properties hold. Um, that is co-represented by the Ravenel Wilson property. Okay, so the Ravenel Wilson Hopfring has this stronger property. It co-represents the same functor in situ in in these much more general categories. And that lets you make so I won't write these things down. So the real theorem about Z2 equivariant homotopy theory that Mike and I show is that the map from, from the ravenel wilson hopfring in C2 equivariant homotopy theory to HZ smash the spaces in real boardism is an equivalence. The real version of the, of the Wilson space hypothesis is that the an analogous map in motivic homotopy theory is a, an equivalence. So that's one, one quick thing. And the other thing is if you if you really start pushing this, well, maybe I'll stop here. I think I should, I've gone over time. I'll stop here.